Radio. You're tuned into the show that informs, entertains, inspires, and promotes motorsports everywhere. Welcome to Winning Wednesday on Northwest Racing Report. Tonight's show is brought to you by Miller Kitchen and Bath, Bailey General Contractor, Myers War Covering, Welter's Gun Shop, and Blaming Pig Barbecue. And by the Wenatchee Valley Super Oval. And by Leonard Evans Used Car Superstore. And by Product41.com. Atomic Screen Printing. And by BLG Blue Line Graphics. Be unique, stand out, get noticed. www.blg.blue. And now, back to your horsepower performance hosts, Terry Bridges and Glenn Lippy Tower. What is going on, racers? Welcome to another edition of. The Northwest Race Report. I'm your horsepower performance host, Terry Bridges. This is the History of Karting Part 3. And we've got with us my main man, Mr. Jason Gibb in the house. What's going on, Gibber? How's it going, guys? How's it going, Terry? How was your day? Dude, it was great. Uh, this weekend I had my uh, had my daughter come up. She came up Friday night. I know it's kind of illegal, but it was just time. And so we hung out and... Uh, did a little bike riding and, um, yeah, just hung out, ate, ate some good food and had some beers, sat in the hot tub, and life was good, Perfect. man. Yeah. Derek Biddle in the house. What's going on, man? Tonight, everybody, this is part three. Been talking with the Gibber uh, over the last couple of weeks. We started out with Phil Fow, and he brought us up to date. We did some talking last week, last couple of weeks about some of the old Speedway stuff. So tonight... Um, Jason and I thought we would talk a little bit about setups. Now, remember, you asphalt guys. Hey, what's up, Maurice? Uh, He's not going to say he's an accomplished asphalt guy. He may have some thoughts and some whatever on it. So please ask your question. But um, just understand that he is not a full-fledged asphalt guy. His, His expertise is dirt. So... Um, we did pretty good on the we did pretty good on the asphalt oval stuff, the stuff that we ran through the years. But yeah, but but you're you aren't anymore. You weren't really a road racer though. No, not not so much. Right, so, I did it. And I was pretty successful at what I did. The little I did do it, but not you you, you sprinted then. The dirt. You sprinted then. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I did, I wasn't aware of that. Cool. Yeah, there was a there was a pro series in Southern California at one time that PKS John Kinder put on. Was that the PKS? No, one? it was it was the Championship Kart Series or something was the name. I don't remember. Exactly yeah, it was a pro, what pro, the, pro Kart Series. Yeah, the PKS. No, 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 it wasn't PKA. It was another. It was another one that came out in like '87. And this Kinder put it on. They were all the races. I think were at Adams, and I did a couple of them. It got a couple fourth or fifths or something. I mean, it was. I mean, it was a solid finish. I didn't win, but I mean, you had to deal with some pretty right heavy hitter sprinter sprinter right guys on. on a regular basis. And that's not my gig. Brian Williamson in the house. Jordan Stotts with us. UAS standout. Rusty Rossmeyer. What's going on, everybody? Hey, uh, Montoya says fuel injection. Yeah, we'll talk about it. We'll we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk about it. So let's 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 get started. Here's my first question because I told you I had one, right? Uh Okay. So when uh, coming from late models. When, or even sprint cars for that matter, okay? Like when you qualified, they, they'd put a, a two-inch spacer in the right rear so that the car would be free for qualifying when the when the track was real heavy, right? So then mm-hmm. as, the, as the track dried out over the night and it started to slick up, they would take the spacer out of the right rear and put it in the left rear to help tighten it up. So mm-hmm. my theory was kind of and this is just this may not be right this was just my thought okay so you've got a, you've got one axle in the go-kart you move the right rear in to tighten it up so it was my belief then that if you moved the left rear out that would be just like continuing to slide the right rear clear over to the left if you could i mean if you can visualize that so I always so, thought by moving the left route, you tighten the card up. Well, some people say, nope, um, that'll loosen it. And I didn't always get that result. Well, 
look at it this way. That was actually, um, as I got later in my career, moving the left retire out was something we did on a regular basis. Um, when the, when the, when the rear, because when you start talking about rear track, rear track width, some people just go by the overall width of the, the track. I, I never did that. I didn't feel that was, there was enough, in, you got enough information. So I would always go by how far off the rim was off the, the frame rail. Um, and that's in my notes. I was just looking, uh, that was a standard measurement for me. Mm-hmm. And so as you move, so there's the, uh, imagine just even whether we talk offset or a straight rail car, you still have a center line of where you're sitting in the car, which is basically the virtual center line of the chassis. As you move the right side tires in, let's say you move the right front and the right rear in an inch, and you take the left rear left side tires and move those out an inch, you effectively, and if you go back and you scale the car, you're going to see a substantial more weight on the right-hand side of the car and less weight on the left-hand side of the car. Oh, Kurt Burr's showing up. Woo-hoo, I'm on point now. Boy, no um, kidding, huh? And, and I just right, got to so say, really, not to interrupt you, but we got Roy Bain from the uh, Tri-State Pro Stock Series. Only t- second time tuning in. Thanks for tuning in, Roy. That's awesome. Appreciate you, man. Okay, go ahead, buddy. So one of the, one of the things to, is that that's a, it's a great turning t- tuning tool that, it, that guys these days on, um, especially the four cycle stuff, don't don't do as much. They pretty much do everything these days with just the prep. But if you learn back in the day as far as uh, how to tune a chassis, that was one of the things that you could do. If a track got super slick, you just move everything on the right side in as tight as you can get it, and you'd move the left side out because you're not really too worried about this car doing much with the left side. If this track's super slick, you're just looking for the right side tires to do something. And the further you change the center line of the chassis, the more, I mean, if you bring that stuff all the way in and move the seat to the right, it's going to, the car is going to work. You're basically setting the car up to work more off the right side tires. Now, that being said, one of the things that we used to do is uh, I always felt when I ran stuff really tight in the back of the car that it, whether it was legends or bullers, it, for me, the car was very captive to its groove. And what I mean by captive to its groove, it would run that one line really well. You understand what I'm saying? But if you but got, if got out got of that, behind, yeah. Well, for, if, if I want to get, if I want to like square this guy and square the corner up, it wouldn't, it wasn't as, uh, it was too captive to the, to that line. I couldn't twitch the car without it wanting to, to get loose or something weird happening. So what I would have, what I, over time and, and myself, Jamie Farrell and, and a few of the guys in the Midwest that, that started doing this, we started running that left rear tire out. Ralph Woodard brought it to the, to the, uh, to the table. Um, he started doing it and then he moved on to four cycle stuff. And there was a bunch of us that started really doing it in the two cycle stuff where you were run that left rear tire consistently two inches off the frame rail. And what it would do was the car was not captive to your line. You could, it was much easier to square off a corner and the thing just stay flat. And you, and at the same time, you'd run quite a bit of stagger. Um, most of the time I was running somewhere between from 1998 to probably the end 2006 or whatever. We were running between two to two and a half, two and five eighths inches of stagger in the back of the car everywhere we went, literally everywhere. We didn't, that was the normal setup in the back, but we were running a whole lot of cross weight at the same time. We were running a minimum of 62 to 65% cross most of the time. Yeah. High of See, from where I'm from, that's great. That's, I mean, I mean, the car wouldn't turn with that much crossing, but. Uh, you got to, you, you have to have the stagger in it though. And you have to have that wheel out. So it's not just moving the wheels. It's the stagger, it's the cross, it's the, you can't have, you know, a bunch of caster rolled in at the same time. Wow, that's, that's, well, because, you know, I, I, I did that with Phil, right? I, we were working on his old track magic that we had, and uh, we, we were, um, we were, we were doing some, some testing, and I said, man, I want to, I want to, um, I want to move that left rear out, because on, on a big car, now I know it's sprung. But on a big car, if you move the left or out two inches, I mean, it puts like 20 – on the scales, it puts 25 pounds on that corner without doing nothing else. 
Now, I know it's sprung, so it's a little bit different. It's, but... spring, it's, it's definitely the sprung, you know, um, if we want to talk a little bit sprung for a minute. When I had my three-quarter midget, we tried running a bunch of cross and all that stuff on the pavement when we did the pavement thing, but and it didn't work no, very well at all. No, no. Fast, but man, the car was fast, but it was all it was almost impossible to drive with anybody else around. So we went to a very very neutral setup with actually lead on the front of the car, um, left rear tight tucked in as tight as you can get it, and the right side tires as far out as you can get them. Um, we actually built special drop front ends and everything for the car, and it was way better with a neutral weight set up on it it made it uh it made it substantially better so for the pavement you're not running as much you're not going to be running as much of that cross weight i mean you might be in like a super modified or something like that but that's you know very very narrow window of what we're talking about here but no um, yeah I, 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 I like the i like to move the tires around a lot that was something david montoya would tell you the same thing i mean uh greg schomberg any of these guys that worked on my stuff, we 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 played with that quite a bit, especially the left rear. Right, and you know, and and these days, Montoya on there uh, says uh, stagger, but you know that's one thing that I noticed going to a lot of these racetracks, the speedway stuff, is staggers not nobody really fools with it that much. I mean, they they may you know with the tires the way they are, you know, I mean, you know, we used to blow them up and stretch them or. You know, I know like Yao will do that. You know, what is it? You you uh, set the you know you you let all the you, you heat the thing up really hot and then you let all the air out and I guess it shrinks it, you know, a whole bunch or or whatever it does. But not a lot of people, uh, they don't they don't play with stagger. You don't see two and three inches or you know an inch and a half or two. I mean, you might see an inch. You know, because they say, well, that's yeah, all, that's I, all know, we can I, get. That's I, all we can get with these tires. Well, yeah, that, that's not true. I mean, even in the, even with the tires today, you can get you can get the stagger. It's that's it's it depends on what you're doing and how you're stretching the tires, but it's there. You just got to work at it. Is it easy? No. And if you're not willing to put the time in, then just run the low stagger setup. Which, you know, I always looked at it like this. Once we started doing the big stagger setup, it seemed to be a big advantage, and not only me, but a lot of my customers. Uh, as long as they were willing to put the time in, they were very, very fast with it. Um, I mean, even on some of our junior stuff at Spokane at the Nationals in 03, I mean, we had Andy Randall and Margerson running almost two inches of stagger over there because it's like a paper clip. Right. You know, and they both won. They won two. The, they both, both won the junior two Duffy that year. So, I mean, it's uh, it all depends. You know, there's, there's guys that get comfortable with that standard setup, you know, with the low stagger. And, you know, for me, uh, we've had really good luck with the Bayer Stagger stuff. And if Jamie Farrell was on here, Ralph Woodard right now on a two-cycle thing, they tell you the same thing. You know, it, it was a lot of work, a lot of extra work to get the tires there, but I think it was well worth it. Absolutely. And I think uh, it just made the car roll through the corner a lot better, especially a place like Tulsa. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, just such a huge advantage when the place started to rubber up to have all that stagger in the car. I mean, it just rolled around the corner, and you just had so much more corner speed than than other people. Yeah, I see a couple of people hey, chiming hey, in. Hey, John... Jenkins runs one and a half to two in his car. Yeah, Brumfeld oh, says anywhere yeah. from inch and a quarter to two and seven eight. So, you know, so it, it is. It, it's, it's a matter of you how you're – But okay, so my next question for you is, I went to uh, Duke Southern put on a – chassis seminar now this was for big cars now, a lot of my stuff that i carry over because i didn't know anything when i was just carding i mean heck foul was making me look good right i was just this grunt but going to my big car you know the way they used to uh what did they say you know uh you wanted 40 to 60 square inches of tire patch on on pavement and 60 to 80 on dirt and so the way you figure that out is you right uh, what is it? Air, uh, weight ver- uh, divided by air pressure gives you your contact patch. So he used to say you start at the right front. So say on a car it would go. Say you'd run like uh, I don't know. Let's just for for the sake of simplicity, let's go twelve on the twelve twelve on the right front, ten on the right rear, eight on the left rear, and six on the left front. Does is that? You know, now I don't know. I mean, that's uh, that's how that's how we used to do it, and then we then we would figure well, out. I mean, I think that I think the biggest thing for me is like you're you're all you are. We are always looking for the you know you 
you want your, I think with karting, even with the UAS stuff, you're looking for just enough grip for 20 laps, right? You do, you, you don't ever want to get the thing hunkered down and you don't want the thing to start too free, you know, and the, my goal was always to make sure the thing was never, ever, ever too tight to start with. Cause I don't like driving a tight race car to begin with, even if it's muddy, that's one thing, but you know, if the car's tight, you know, you're going to end up being some someone's just going to start pounding on you because the thing's not rotating i usually tried to drive a car that was fairly free um and when we got into the bigger stagger setup in the back that was um you know whatever it was mid 90s mm-hmm. um when i was running for buller um that it just made all the difference in the world and it you know you 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 know there was a time where we were doing the big stagger thing in the front we got away from that because the car wouldn't roll over on the right front enough so went down to typically most of the time was like an inch, an inch and a quarter. Um, unless there was just a ton of grip, then you could go up. Right. Um, and a lot of it was all just grip. A lot of it was just grip depending on how much grip it was. Like you were talking about um, some of the Midwest tracks that were real slick. Um, you know, even, even a situation like that, you know, you can still get away with a fair amount of stagger because the thing is, you're just going to go down in there, you're going to roll and you're going to roll out of the throttle as soon as you roll out of the throttle, if that thing's nice and neutral, it just rolls on around the corner. Um, and the stagger does the job for you and you don't have to barely even move the steering wheel. Right. Uh, which, which, you know, again, you know, same, same kind of situation happened at Hanford. You know, we talked about spring run last week. You know, the big difference with some of the guys that do this stuff now in the South is like, they have a lot of tracks that are super high grip. Um, and, um, that's a completely different animal. Um, you're, I mean, and some of those tracks got more grip than pavement, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's a that's a complete different animal than than the low the low grip stuff. It's it's you know the seats as low as you can go. The VCG needs to be low. I mean, you better better find those have those old tires, the old blue codes. So Montoya says whatever. Montoya says loose is fast. However, I will say Butch Miller. Who was one of the? He was one of the great short oh, yeah. track racers. He says a push will come to you. A loose will just keep on a going away. That was his. That was his statement. So um, I don't know if I'd buy that totally. I mean, I'm not going to argue with Butch Miller because he was a great driver. Um, sometimes when stuff's tight, it just it, it never comes around. I'll, I'll, that's the way I I I would equate that. And for my driving stuff, sometimes when you get stuff that starts out tight, man, it just never, or you, you end up cooking the front tire off, uh, which is not, not good. I mean, I, I was a big fan of finding uh, a, a very neutral setup because if you can get something that's pretty neutral, you're going to have a better chance of getting under guys coming off the corner or when you go to drop below them at the end of the straightaway, which was one of the my little things I loved at Ventura was, you know, you, cause we were, we had the thing free enough. And so you get down there and the thing was just, you could just kind of park it getting underneath them at the very end of the straightaway and you get by them. Um, it's, it's, it's the whole package. That's the, the to me, it's the, <laughs> that's the thing that's important to, to, you know, you can't really take the clams out of the clam chowder cause you really don't have clam chowder left. It's the same thing um, with a race car. I mean, it's, you know, I've had plenty of customers that have tried taking my setup and taking the big stagger out of it because they didn't work on the tires during the week, and all of a sudden their car is ridiculously tight because they got an inch in the back. I'm like, this setup's not going to work with one inch in the back. It's going to be awful, and it is awful. Well, well, I told you, if you don't have the stagger in it, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, your brother said you know, tight, got... tight is right. <laughs> yeah. Well, let let me ask you then. Well, uh, um, um. Well, shoot, I had it here. Um, well, I'll, I'll I'll remember it. I had something I was going to ask you, but um, I mean, it's I think it's I think it's just important to. Oh, the, oh, I know what I was going to ask you. Can you have a good setup and still be out of balance? Sure. So but at then, the end of the day, I so mean, then what? Here's the, the thing with set with setups at the end of the day. No matter what you do, smush. Small stagger setup, big stagger setup, you know, if you like a car tight, if you like a car loose, at the end of the day, for that given evening, the stopwatch or the micron or whatever, how you're doing your timing system, mm-hmm. how you manage that data through mm-hmm. the evening mm-hmm. is 
what's important, right? You can't, you can't just bank off of, and that's one of the things that Tulsa, Tulsa was so cool. I mean, you needed to be up there time and like, well, let's say we're running the, the unlimited class at Tulsa in before us was Briggs heavy and there's like 10 flights of those guys. So you wanted to start with like the first flight of Briggs heavy and you wanted to start time on those guys. And then the next flight, then the next flight, and the next flight, and the next flight, because you want to see how fast that track's going. Cause they're all Briggs heavy cars. They're all 370 pounds Briggs flathead. And so if you start seeing all the lap times, the guys running up front start really going down, you know, this track's getting faster. So why would you go back out there with the same gear, the same setup, the same everything? You know the track's faster. Now, you're not out there, but the data, the lovely word we hear every day right now, is it's there for you. You just have to figure out how you're going to apply that. Mm -hmm. Typically, like at Tulsa, like in a Yamaha, from a heat race to the main event was about seven to eight teeth less. Wow, that's crazy. It's a, a lot. Yeah, and you know, most guys, they don't, I mean, and here's, and, and, and I mean, we'll get back to my balance question, but that's why, um, you know, and a lot of people, you know, what's, whether it's go-karts or cars or, or shopping carts or whatever it is, to me, if you don't take good notes, you're a fool. I, 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 I've always believed in them. I, I just, I don't know how people do it. And then expect to come back and try to have any clue where they're at. If you try to go, oh like, yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't bring hundred hundred percent. I have four notebooks spanning my whole career and and carding alone, and I have notebooks for all the mountain bike stuff we do. Um, I mean, it's there's no way. I mean, you can't remember it, it all. It, Guys say, "Oh, I got it well, right here in my head," and I'm like, "You know what? That is the biggest bunch of BS I've ever heard." Was it three eighths or three sixteenths? Yeah. Well. Uh, Jason, wait a minute. We we went out with three. No, it wasn't. It was three sixteenths. Are you sure? Or was it three eighths? Well, uh, and the thing uh, is, know. too, like, like, like the Tulsa situation. I mean, like, when you tell somebody, go take off six teeth for the main event, they look at you like you're absolutely crazy. But when the track at that point in time is a second and a half, two seconds faster than it was the day before, you you better take it off, or you're going to go out there and you're going to make the warm up lap, and the thing's going to be turning. 15,000 and you're, you're screwed. <laughs> you're going to go backwards so fast it's not you're not going to even know. And then those same yeah, guys I mean, are the same guys that are they're throwing their hands up in the air going I, I don't I don't understand. We're we're never we're never, you know, it's because, you know, yeah. it, 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 it's it's I, I loved your statement early on. If you're not willing to do the work, then don't expect, you know, you what do they say? You're you're, you're not going to get uh, caviar out of potato salad. You're just not going to do, right? Well, that's, I mean, it's, I mean, and I said this before, and I'll say it again. It's, it's one of the things that was tough early on uh, compared to today is, you know, I, I just felt by the time I was done in the mid 2000s, um, everybody, you know, because they spent their five grand or six grand or whatever they spent on a go kart, um, they expected to win, and. I, I still think that is absolutely ludicrous to this day. Um, I, I just don't understand just because you spent money with somebody that you deserved to win. You know, now you need to work at it and develop your method of madness on, you know, what it's going to take and well, you spend an hour on it every week in the shop and that's it. And everybody else is taking notes and, you know, going to parking lots and making sure things are ready before they get there, they're going to beat you week in and week out. Oh, absolutely, go. Gibber. I mean, you can be as frustrated as you want, but at the end of the day, I mean. That's right. I had a couple I had a couple customers that flat quit and went somewhere else just because they didn't want to put the time in. And they wanted to just go to the racetrack and let it let it sit in the lawn at Jackson Curry and, and watch. And then was their time pushed up? Well, I'm not the right guy for you if that's what you want to do. It just, I mean, I listened. Well, it's fine. Let's let's I, face I don't, it. I don't. You know, you. I mean, if 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 you were on an older cart, and you know, and maybe it wasn't up to date or all that, you know, whatever. Getting a new cart automatically does help to some degree. Now that doesn't mean you're going to go to the front, but people are going to go. Oh boy, 
That guy, that guy, yeah, used, to, that guy used to be a toad, like, and now he's kind of, oh, man, I got to kind of maybe worry about him. But eventually I, I that catches story. you up. I, yeah. I, the thing is, I got a great story about that. I got a guy that I met. His name Lonnie Dickey. I met him when I first moved up here. He was married at the time and had uh, uh, a kid and a wife. And anyway, they were splitting up, and <clears throat> he had this cart. And I was like, dude, let me – this thing always handled like crap, like always. Always, always, always. It was a Margate dual chassis, and he had them just one Yamaha on the left, and they'd swap rides in Monroe and Oakwood. And this thing was just a toad. And he was friendly with everybody. I mean everybody. Well, I said, hey to him, you know, I said, why don't we go down to Jackson Prairie this weekend? you got nothing going on. I said, we'll run your motor. We'll put my tires on it. We'll finally scale this thing. We'll go down there and run Yamaha medium and Yamaha heavy. And keep in mind, when I mean everybody likes him, everybody likes him. So we get the thing on the scales at my shop, 67.5% rear weight. Now, anybody that's online or anybody that's raced a go-kart, 67.5% rear weight, yeah, pretty sure it's never going to turn. So anyway, we move the seat and we get some lead up front and we get the thing all worked out and I had to put this chassis up on a gas can and get the thing tweaked back to where it needed to be. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we go down to Jackson, go down to Jackson Prairie after an extensive setup session to get this thing fixed, and he wins both heats in light and medium, and wins both main events, and just drives away from everybody in this old Margay. And there's guys that were his buddy at the beginning of the night that were not his buddy at the end of the night because all of a sudden now they were in the way and he had to move them to keep keep going, and they were pissed at him. I mean, it was. It was it was absolutely one of the funniest things I ever saw in my life, mm -hmm. um, you know. And the guy went on; he finished that year up, and then bought a legend and went and ran Jackson Curry the following year and won the Yamaha Light and Medium Championship. Um, so it just proves that if you can you put the time in, even with an older car, um, and spend the time on the scales and get the wheels all pointed in the right direction and replace the bearings so the stuff works, and it, it, it just goes a long way. I mean, it you can make that stuff pretty fast oh gib let, let's face it you know i mean yeah that that's correct you know the just, oh, I, I don't care what basics. yeah i don't care whether it's straight rail or new stuff or whatever everything has a sweet spot it's up to you to find that sweet spot and that's what most people aren't willing to do is to to go out and do the work and you know well, how many times did you get asked hey hey gibber what what should i do here and you tell them and then they turn around and tell you every reason why that's not going to work. Well, then what? What did you ask me for? Right. Well, that's why we, you know, when I had my when I had my shop, I it was like I just I just because I could, I would scale anybody's car that wanted it scaled and try to make it better at the racetrack. Now, if you came to the shop, that cost money. At the track, it, it was free. But um, I think that that proved that even people that had older equipment and we got them running better right away that it proved that, you know, they, it wasn't just a legend chassis and a Collins motor and a Berkey clutch and whatever. I mean, we could make anything run good. And, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's about how much time you're going to put into it, right? You have to, I mean, you don't have to have digital scales. It makes it way nicer, but I mean, you could, I mean, for hey. years we used bathroom scales at grand nationals. You know what? Me and Fowl I mean, used, I'm, me and Fowl used the little thing that had the, you know, like a weight jack. You put the little yeah. thing and it hooked the inside, you know, and you picked it up. And you used a piece of paper. Sure. Hell, that's all yep. we used I mean, for. That's all we used at almost everything. The first scale scale pad I ever saw was Doug Henlein's, it, and he gave it to me to take to the Nationals in '87. And uh, we leveled that scale pad with a bottle of oil because we didn't have a level. Hundred percent true. Wow. Um, yeah. So anyway, I mean. A lot of it's just it's the details of it, right? I mean, you know, for years before the laser toe came out, I had a bar that I would bolt to the rear axle and square the right front with that um, long before there was a laser. And then I, I had a, I would either, I had a scale that I could measure within, you know, I'd get the front end within a, probably 10 thousandths, which is close enough for a go-kart. So let um, me ask you, when you, when you did the toe, like on our big cars, the way we would do it is, um, we would we would get the left we would get the left side tires dead true to the world, and we do all our toe adjustment off the right front. I did it backwards from that. 
and we would get the right side tires point in the right direction and put all the toe in the left. Okay. So, and, and, and to now, you, you now, change, as you change, as you change the camber, that changes the toe. So every well, time yes. you change camber, left positive or negative, it changes the toe. So you have to come back and square the toe, and then you got to come back and readjust the weights at the same time. Correct. I mean, that's just standard. I mean, what, every action there's something. Yep, equal you know, and opposite um, reaction. That's correct. Wow, that's that's yeah. I mean, I mean. You know that that's that to me that this is why this is exactly why you and I talked earlier before the show and you said I'm not going to get into this but that's exactly why I hate prep because what I think it does is it takes uh learning I mean I I, I still think if you took prep away the fast guys are still going to be fast and and what have you however I just think it it is uh, such a big crutch that these days more guys know about the prep to make their cart work than they actually do to make the go kart work for how they want. And I and I and I, yeah, and, I, mean, I don't, and I don't like that. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it, you know, the problem was once it got. I mean, the genie was kind of still in the bottle in the middle of the eighties, but once it started getting out, you know, the problem is is neither organization was willing to put a cap on it at the time. Um, and when WK finally did put a cap on it, the one year they went from whatever it was, 2000 entries at Daytona to 135. Basically nobody showed up. They went from 2000 entries to barely over a hundred. Um, it was awful. I mean, so, I mean, at that point in time, the people spoke, right. They wanted prep. And they didn't care. I mean, they didn't. I mean, it was a non-prep situation, and they didn't. They, there was someone else had a money race that was prepped at the same time, and everybody went there. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of us on this side of the country that, you know, my brother's a, a big advocate of the whole dreads and tear offs, and I mean, I, I, I think that the racing <clears throat> can be better if tracks are prepped correctly. Uh, well, here's here's I what I think. That, I mean, at the end of the day. Cup cars are going to go to a 20 inch tire, or an 18 inch rim in a couple of years. Is, is it going to be any better than the 15, or, is it, or are they just going to be overhooked? I mean, it's the, right. to the point where they're just glued to the ground and not sliding around, and are they just going to be following the leader because they're, you know, right? So it's the it's the same kind of thing, right? I mean, it's it's uh, you don't when you go to the sprint car track or the midget track to go watch and pay your 20 bucks to get in these days, probably you know whether it's Skagit up here, or Elma. Or, Paris down in California or whatever, you're going there to race. You're not, you're going there to watch something that's going to be a side by side and high groove, low groove. Maybe something in the middle. Maybe it's going to rubber down. You're looking for that, right? That's what's. You're looking for a show. Mm-hmm. You're not looking for follow the leader. Mm-hmm. And then, just so happens that one guy makes a tiny mistake, and the next thing you know, five guys are trying to fill that hole because they know there's no other way they're going by. So it's just a different kind of racing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and not it's it, you know I was I partaked in it I was part of it um, I definitely feel like you know I definitely brought that whole prep thing to town up here I mean remember when I started doing it severely at Oakwood and guys were trying everything under the sun to figure out what I was doing at the time and uh, you know it's uh, I'm not sure it was the best thing for the region as a whole you know because everybody was running treads and they weren't prepping and they were having a good time so. Here right. I come in and yeah, I and, and, and like you said, and, we we could beat that up all day long. It's here to stay. We're yeah, not going to so get rid of it. It's not even worth. We're not going to get rid of it. No. So if you're going to race carts, especially at a national level, you have to understand the prep game. You have to do it. I mean, that's it. I mean, mm-hmm. there's no if ends or buts about it. I mean, you you have to do it. So, so let me ask you then. Um, Here's my crazy yeah, question: Is okay? So you know. We, I mean, on go karts, you know, we run slicks, we run treads. It just depends on the surface. But you, you, you get cage carts, and all these guys run their treads, you know. And I, and I tell them, how come you guys aren't? How come you guys don't run slicks for God's sake? I mean, slick. Uh, uh, I, I was told their, slicks are half a second faster anywhere in the country, and here you guys are running try. I don't get it. They have to run them. They have to run them. That's the rule. Would they be they faster if they the, were on they, slicks? Well, the problem with those things, they don't want them to get them overhooked, right? They, those things are designed to slide a little bit. They don't, they, they can't run them completely flat as a, like a, like a, uh, like a, like, like a cart. speedway cart. Right. Yeah. 
So John Brumfield's asking, do I like higher pressure or lower pressure? So it depends. Um, you can get away with lower pressure on Maxis than you can on, let's say, a Burris. Um, typically, somewhere in the seven to eight pounds of air at the most on the right, and somewhere around three to four on the left. And with Mac, with Burris and down on the, the Maxis stuff, you can get down around six, seven pounds, and okay. probably around the same on the left side. Okay, so let me ask typically, you. Okay, go ahead, finish. And that's typically where I would we would we would start and play within that range, and then depending on the again, I'm going to go back to how much grip the track has. You know, the higher the grip, um, sometimes you can run. You know, in my in, if it's really if it's dry if it's a dry racetrack and it's rubbered up um, and it's abrasive, you can go up on air, and that thing's just going to grow, right? And so if you think about it this way, if a tire gets hotter and it grows, it's just going to help free the car up as it's going through the run too which isn't a bad thing because it's just the track's going to get faster and faster and more rubber as the main event goes along. So that's one of the things you got to think further than five laps out. See, and that's what Um, I was going to say, because when we were road racing, one of the things I remember that Phil taught me was it was wet. And, and so we didn't run our normal air pressure. We blew those things up to like 30 pounds. And I'm like, he says, do you know why they do that? I go, I got no idea. He says, because as you blow it up, you lose the, contact but you run more on the center and so now you don't have the whole tire sliding around you only got part of it sliding around and so we were actually a bunch faster in the rain now i know that's a little bit different than the dirt but the theory is kind of the same we were a right. bunch and faster the whole, in the rain yeah well the big thing with the rain and i ran a road race car in portland in the rain um and the, the big thing in the rain is like you're, you're already running narrow tires. You just, you just air them up so that they have more crown. Um, and the other thing on pavement too, that's quite a bit different than on the dirt um, in the rain. You, you don't ever run the standard groove. You, you run out of where the rubber is or down near the curb. You're substantially higher on the racetrack. Um, or if you could do like I did at Portland because they didn't use the bus stop when I was there. And just sit up at the end of the straightaway to slow yourself down and slam yourself back in the seat and just keep the thing to the wood and dump the pipe and off you go. <laughs> so you had a you had a slippy on yours? Yeah, we came up in eighty eight and ran in Portland. We were gonna I was supposed to come back to the nationals and I don't remember why I didn't come back. I was riding for Dominator at the time and we came up there and had a hell of a race. Foster won and there was me, Zimmerly, I don't know, there was five of us in a pack. Foster was gone and I I run second for literally most of the race we got down to the last two or three laps and i wiggled coming off a nine there coming on the front straightaway and these generally and these other guys went cooking by me when i pulled in behind them we come back around and as we came into the the chicane to come into nine i put the middle of the cart right over across the uh, rumble strips and went right to the outside of these guys nine and got got the pipe, started pulling the pipe in sooner. And I went right down the outside next to the wall. They were all lined up together. And I went by all of them on the outside and then flat footed one with the pipe all the way in and ended up getting second. And they were screaming at me at the scales. Like I was nuts. I'm like, this is like another Saturday night at the dirt track boys. I don't know what you're so excited about. <laughs> well, you know, that just tells me. Uh, or you're just pissed at the guy from Mark Foster. miles away. It's worth you at your own track. Mark Foster was a stud on road race. Yeah. Yeah. Both he and Greg were, they had it. Fi- they had it figured out, baby. I was, I was happy with the second against these guys. I mean, this is only like the third time I'd road race. Oh yeah, every time I'd ran, no, we'd no, we'd and run not... up front. I mean, it was good. I mean, it was you know whatever fifty guys in the class, and here you are running in the top. Yeah, not taking three, nothing away from you there, front. nothing at all. No. Just saying, Foster that's how was, he was in another another zip code. He was, he was gone. He had a over a half straightaway on us. It was yeah. history. Yeah, he, he was they, good. they were smart. You know what? And you talk about guys that do the work. Um, I, I remember they took me under their wing sprinting, and um, a lot of my, a lot of my, you know, understanding and work ethic and whatever came from those guys because they, um, they didn't fool around, man. They'd take carburetors apart and, you know, flow brake clean through them so they could see where all the passages went. I mean, they actually really understood what they were working on. And That's cool. It was cool, man. I mean, I, I mean, I can't say that I learned. I, I did learn a lot. It was kind of like water in the bamboo, right? At the time, it was too overwhelming for me. But as I went down the road, I realized all those steps and how um, 
you know, how important they were and how important they are and, and what a difference it I mean, you, you know. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but when you're talking about it, I mean, I knew how to take that orange ball and put it through the hoop. I did not know. <laughs> I did not know anything about racing. I knew nothing. I couldn't read a tape measure. I mean, I didn't know jack. And I'm, I'm telling you, uh, it was uh, racing for me was one of the hugest learning experiences um, ever. Now, I'm not going to say I, I went on to have a successful career, but I mean, in the big car stuff, I mean, I, I, you know, after considering it all, I did pretty good, you know, and I'm happy with it. I mean, was I going to go be Daytona 500? No, but um, Willamette Speedway every Saturday night was my Daytona 500, and I knew that, and that's the way I treated it. And I and I wish more guys would would do that. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, if you're going to go do it. That's why I tell these guys. So many guys are complaining and griping. Geez, I'm not, you know, you're not putting the work in. This is no different. Just because it's go-karting doesn't mean you get to treat it like it's, uh, you know, I don't know, like a game of putt putt golf. I mean, you still got to work your ass off. It's a lot of work. Man. It is I mean, a lot of work, and people don't understand that. I mean, being fast ain't easy. And if it and if it was, everybody would be fast. And uh, right. people don't understand that. They 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 really don't. So let me get back to my question about balance. What you know, you said I said, can you have a good setup and still be out of balance? And you said yes. So. What in your mind? So, Lee, what is the definition of balance? of balance? Yeah, what is the definition of balance? So, the definition of balance to me is like what the conditions are. So, you can be, you might have a setup on a car that's a little off right now, but it's just a matter of time that as the night's going to go along, that it's probably going to come to you. But you got a ten lap heat race right now, so. You know that. So let's say you you raced the previous week and you came home and man, you did this setup for the main event and it was great. So you came back with that setup. And now mm, she's a little snug or she's a little loose or whatever the case may be. Um, going into the heat race after practice, it's just not it's not what it was the previous week. So you know the balance is probably going to be pretty close for later, but the balance for the here and now is not. I mean. And so one of the things that was really uh, one of the things that we would do on a regular basis was just add weight to the nose of the car, right? If the thing's not turning or it's a little snug, just add more, add more nose weight. And like, it's amazing what five pounds in front of the front axle will do to take a go-kart from just being eh, to, whoa, this is really good. Um, and, you know, it. sometimes you put it over on the right side. Sometimes you put it on the left, depending on what you're looking for this thing to do. Um, and it's you're not changing any tires. You're not changing anything. You're just putting five pounds in the nose, wherever you strategically need to have it, and then move it. And, and that, a lot of times that could be worth, you know, two, two three tenths just by putting five pounds of weight on the nose of the car. Wow. Well, what now, what about caster camber? I mean, you know, now a lot of people are, you know, confused by that. I mean, you know, does does more make it tighter? Does more make it less? Does less make it more? I mean, what kind of can you – I mean, I know there's probably no exact science to it, but, I mean, in a nutshell. Well, typically, typically the more caster you run, the more weight you are going to move as you turn the wheel, right? So if you run – Let's just say you're, you're running 15 degrees of caster on both sides for the sake of conversation. These days, and even into the 90s, I'd say let's just go. Let's go. Let's go late 90s forward. Typically, a lot of the stuff was in in you know you'd run you'd run about depending on the cars. You know, you, you, you just, there was a tendency to want to run a lot of caster. Now, now, wait, before you go, let me help me understand. So the more caster you run, when it, when it, so really what you're doing is jack and weight, which is actually picking yeah. up that left rear, right, as you get in, right? Or planting, or planting the left rear. Okay. Right? So, or, or you're planting the left rear, depending on what you're doing. You know, as you, as you, as you bring that steering wheel around, it's just dry. And then if you, if you tow, if you turn to the right. It's going to plant the left rear. So as you're getting um, in, it's freeing it a little yeah. bit, and as you get off, and then, 
Right. So, you know, and the more caster you run, it, it'll help you, it'll help you get off the corner, but it won't get you into the corner. It's going to, there's a challenge getting in. Right. So, and, but the thing is that as time evolved along, like when we ran the Buller, like a lot of people were on the Buller stuff, you know, 18 and 22, 22 on the right, 18 on the left was pretty common setup. And then we started slowly peeling that out, realizing that we wanted to try to, it kind of got to the point where you want to just run absolutely the bare minimum of caster that you can get away with because you're not looking, going back to what I said earlier about this, almost a neutral setup as possible. You don't want to shift too much weight too fast, too violently. Got it. The more violent that gets, the more violent that weight gets distributed, the the harder it is on getting the setup correct. Now, what about um, cam? Harder is to drive. What about cam? Well, camber. So typically, on you know, the more on on a on a speedway cart, on the I'll use the right front for example. You know, the more grip there is, the more camber you can typically get away with, because you're looking to reduce drag in the front end of the car right the overall grip of the car the more camber you put in there you're going to have less tire on the ground and if you can get it hooked up and not burn the inside of the tire off there's going to be less drag right Mm -hmm. your contact patch is just way smaller i mean if you got that thing kicked over to four degrees that's you know now down the straightaway that's true but what you know my understanding is you know, that camber is, you know, it's supposed to be so down the straightaway, yes. But as you turn and you go into the corner, as the weight's coming over and it's heading to the right, what that does is it's, it, it kind of stands those tires up so you get that patch mm-hmm. in the middle of the corner. That was my understanding. Nah. Of it. it also changes the amount of grip, right? I mean, if you want more traction on the right front tire, you're going to run less camber, right? I mean, if you as you straighten that tire up and you go to turn it, there's going to be, it's going to put more more weight on that tire. So... And so if you same, can run- same thing with the left front. If you if you if you look at like a lot of old dirt cars, they'd sit in their negative. Well, these days you don't see any cars running any negative. All the all the modern cars are at zero or they're plus, and they don't run too much plus because when you run too much plus, kind of like we were saying with the cast caster earlier, as you drove down on the corner and as you start to turn that wheel with all that camber on the left front, what's going to happen is it's going to start. As you start to go into the corner, it's going to unload that left rear tire. So now you got a loose condition. Now, as you come through the corner and start to straighten that wheel up, it's great coming off. But so again, so, so what determines you're, you're, whether? How do you decide whether I'm going to take some camber out of it to free it up or add camber in it to free it up? Say you're having, say you're tight getting in. Are you gonna? Are you gonna take some of the? Are you gonna? Are you gonna add more caster? Or are you going to take away, are you going to, um, you know, uh, take away? Typically we got to the point where we got to the point with the, with the legend stuff, but we weren't, we, we were, we weren't playing with caster very much, uh, at the racetrack. Um, you know, unless we, unless we really missed it for one reason or another, we pretty much was focused on the camber and the things in the front and what we would do at the back of the car, mm-hmm. uh, just in, just in the rear end of the car. Mm. Um, and you know, I, we got to the point where we were playing, probably playing within like running from between zero and one and a quarter on the left front and anywhere from four to a half on the right front. Like when we were in New Mexico in 2002, it was just slick, slick. And there was a lot of dust on the racetrack. So, I mean, you couldn't run a high grip set up there. It just, it, even though it had some bank, it just, you had to, you had to lay that thing over to get it to rotate. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you had to run a lot of nose, a fair amount of nose weight, um, to get this thing to turn because it was slick. Um, you couldn't just clamp the back of the car down. So um, we ran, I think, like three quarters degree of camber in the right front, and uh, close to zero on the left because we just didn't want a lot of things. We didn't, I didn't want a lot going on. Right. We needed this thing to stay fairly neutral and just kind of roll around the corner on its own, not 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 over jacking the weight right one direction or the other. So would you ever raise the front and lower the back or was it always, or would you raise the whole cart as a whole if you were going to do that? I had separate spindles that I always, if I wanted to raise the whole uh, car um, for the front where I I had the spindle spuds lower down so I could get the whole, whole, uh, whole frame up higher. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, and I had another set of cassettes. Like when we went, perfect. New Mexico is a perfect example. We had another set of cassettes that I machined off the bottom of it and drilled some holes because I knew it was going to be slick, so I could run a, a higher ride height in the car. And I had spindles where I had, had pushed the spindles buds as far down as I could go. And I had a left front for like to get a lot of wedge in the car because we ran like seventy two percent cross there. Jeez Louise! Holy! So, I mean, there's. Smokes. Yeah, we, we. I mean, there's there's a lot of that stuff that you can do to. To. Uh, I mean, I'm a, I, I just got to the point where I was a big fan of like, I don't want to disrupt this thing with too much one thing or the other. I mm -hmm. I was still a big fan of the stagger. Um, uh, that was kind of a mainstay of my my setup. Mm -hmm. um, I got to be honest, I got to the point where it's really hard for me to even drive anything that's not like that because I did it for so many years that when I got to get in somebody else's stuff, I feel like a bit of a squid um, because it's just not, it's not the feel mm -hmm. that I'm looking for. What about stagger across the front? This, I mean, I know for us, really all it did was affect wedge, but I know on a go-kart it's a little bit different. I mean, did you run, I mean, was it a half an inch or a quarter inch or would an inch be bigger? Or? No, we ran, we, it, some, it, 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 I went through a phase where I ran a lot up there at one point in time, of course it's two inches, and then from probably two, I would say 2000 to the end there, the last six years, we were probably running between an inch to an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Mm -hmm. if you yeah. run too much the, the cars don't want to roll over on the right front and do enough you're 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 not giving the car a chance to do its thing in, in the sweet spot that's been my and the stiffer cars it's just going to be even worse right the cars i'm talking about were fairly soft in comparison to some of the umax stuff or the phantom stuff i mean you you, you got to let it roll over or that's, so, that thing's never gonna so now it's never gonna turn what about gear where did where did you? I mean, some people say, well, you know, you want it to be, you know, you want it to peak like just past the flag stand or seven eighths or you know, eleven sixteenths, whatever it is. Where did you where did you judge where you wanted the thing to peak at, or did you even worry um, about it? Yeah, I did. It was a big thing for me. Uh, I tried to run, you know, minus indoors when you're out in the outdoor stuff specifically. Uh, we can talk. We can kind of point to that um I, the smallest gear i could get away with on the back axle was my goal uh when we would run we went to newman in 97 and i got just absolutely obliterated the first day and super stock heavy i think i ran 12th just got smoked um i was running q98 on this tt75 and driving for bowler and he's looking at me like dude what happened you know I'm just like, this thing was bad and so we started thinking about it, and what we do, we uh, we went back to the Q96, and we dropped 13 teeth for the Friday for Superstock Light. 13. I looked up the notes. Same racetrack. Um, but, but if somebody, probably, probably. but if you were trying to judge, I mean, you've got a feel of years. But if somebody was new and they said, "Hey, how do I know?" Well, there's there's kind of two schools of thought, right? There's the keep the pipe short and twist the twist the RPM. Or you're going to run the pipe long, and you're going to take the gear off. For me, specifically on the super stock stuff and the Yamaha stuff, I, I didn't have any success with just twisting, twisting the motor. It just uh, I had, and with my customers, and even like when I ran for Collins on the dyno, when we was there, dyno and pipes that I'd cut up here and tried some stuff there, and just most of the time the stuff just worked better long. Now on the CRE seven stuff, which probably one of the few, um, that worked quite a bit better, quite a bit better short. That's one of the ones I would say is one of the few that it didn't didn't run better long. Mm -hmm. um, but where should you be gauging on the racetrack? Should you be looking at just past the flag stand, or do you want it? No, to... you, it's all. Well, you have to kind of understand. One of the tricks with gear is like, and I'll use Castle Rock because that's an absolutely perfect scenario. If you go to Castle Rock. Everybody's talking. Oh, you should be somewhere between whatever six, six seven or six eight to seven zero. Oh. I, mean, I couldn't disagree more. Um, the big thing, like with Castle Rock in this example, is you can start taking gear off there, and then you hit your micron, and it still says fourteen one. And you took two more teeth off, and it still says fourteen one. You took another one off, and it still now it says fourteen. Well, you took a tooth off. It should be more than hundred RPM, right? 
But you're getting in the throttle sure. earlier, right? Dude, you're, well, I don't know about that. But at this point in time, there's let's say you're running the same laps. Why is this thing? You just took three teeth off and you only lost 100 RPM. That tells me that you're not in the honey hole. You're 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 twisting this thing and it's just, you're going past the torque and it's not pulling it all the way down the straightaway. And so you're gonna so you just keep taking gear off and gear off and gear off to the point where the thing finally stabilizes where the thing's finally got a bog to it. And I think you'd find that, you know, when we, when we ran there, we were running anywhere from a six, five to a six, seven. I think we ran a six, four here there one night when the track was super fast and we were actually in the, in the high 17s or low 16s or whatever it was. Gee. For Yamaha. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I mean, again, just the car is free as possible too. And then with that gear, there's no way anybody's going to go by you at the end of the straightaway. No way. Mm-hmm. But, so, it's, but it's all how you get off at that point, right? I mean, if if, if you well, can't get off really, with the because, Tinker's I mean, Dam, I like mean. Castle, Castle Rock's road racing and a road is road racing and oval. So anybody that's ever gone road racing, you're not turning the thing 15,000. You're not turning it 14,500. There's no way. Um, you know, so at the end of the day, you, you do need this thing to just chug. It's like going down the front straight or at Portland and a Yamaha lay down or Yamaha sit up. You're not turning that thing 15,000. You're turning it mid 13s. So it's, it's a completely different program and you have to set up for that. It's, it's just not, it's just not that. And so you have to be, I mean, you know, Ventura was the same way when we ran there with little gear. I mean, it made all the difference in the world. If you could have the, get the car freed up enough, but you got to be able to free the car up. If you still have the car stuck down and you have the little gear on there, you're not comfortable driving something that's a little loose then you're going to be, then the thing's not going to leap off the corner hard enough. And I'm just picking these questions by random, but my la- my no, last question good. since we're, we're, since we're, we're, since we're doing, getting close, but what about do equal length tie rods matter? I mean, you know, I've seen sometimes, you know, they run a longer one on the right and a short one on the left, or they're both equal or, you know, I mean, does it, does it make any difference? Well, it, it what you're talking about is an acronym, right? So it's the acronym is the rate of the, the ratio of the, the difference in the, what one tire turns to the other. Correct. Um, you see, some, like some like the, the old Margays were right. The old Margays were that way. They had a lot of acronym. The left well, you, you turn you can way with, in. You can, and... do it with a, you can do it with a steering shaft by putting them instead of having them piggybacked on each other. They can be side by side, or you can do it on the uh, spindle by moving it forward. Uh, there's usually a couple holes where you can put two holes in there. I mean, there's, there's ways to do it. Um, and a lot of times, I mean, we're, we play with a little bit on the dirt, but where it seems to be, uh, to, uh, be a bigger deal is on the pavement. Um, you know, cause your chain, as you, as you change that, the rate of which that wheel turns, which is that, which is the difference between the right and the left, let's say, depending on where you're, tire is on the on sprint the your scrub radius is huge right because on sprint it, it, it takes all things into consideration to normal setups of a normal car that kingpin should be coming down through about a the quarter a quarter of the the width of the 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 tire coming into the the contact patch and it, carts don't do that right so on, on the pavement there and the reason they do that is to have more mechanical advantage on a on a, on a regular sprint chassis so, I mean, it's on a dirt car, it's different because you got the tire hugged all the way, pretty much hugged all the way in. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, those, that, those things do make a difference. Cause I mean, if you can get the thing to rotate sooner, you know, from the first tug of the wheel, the thing's going to come up and come down to the bottom, uh, you're going to be better off hmm. for sure. So just to make, clarify what you said earlier in the show, when I asked you, so does moving the left rear out make it freer or does it make it tighter? It, I think it makes it freer and more neutral. That's why I, it's, I'm a big fan of that. It makes it a little freer, but it, so let's say we move the left rear tire out, but then I put the weights back to the same spot. And that's typically what we would do. We would move the left rear tire out then readjust the weights back to where we wanted. But, the, but that tire being out, because now it's going to, it's going to unload sooner because it's off, but the weights of the weight are the same way as we went out the last time. But all we did was move the tire out. 
what that gives you is a is a more neutral car to move around you're not so captive to your line so it's freer in a dynamic situation if you think about it as a static situation you have to always put the weight back to where it was so if you, if you car, didn't if you didn't readjust the weight as my brother just said perfect less twitch it's less twitchy it gives you more of an opportunity to drive the car and not have to react as much okay that's that's okay. Then that answers kind of my so in in its own sense it does kind of tighten it up. But I I get it because I did that with Phil and he didn't like it because he likes he likes the ass in twitchy. He likes to be able to toss it around and horse it around and and do what he need. And he was pretty well. I mean it was when I did it we were almost three tenths quick, not quite three tenths quicker on the watch. But he didn't like it so. Uh, you know, I ended up putting it back because he, he, he didn't like it, but, um, we've that, all been there. Yeah. You know, that's the way it goes, you know, but man, Gib, you're, you're, you're not kidding. You know, I gotta, I gotta get your brother in here. Hang on. What's, What's up race, race fans? fans? This, this is, is the, the real, real deal. deal. Chris Gibb, and you're listening to the Northwest, Northwest race, race report. report. I'm still waiting for yours, Jason. So I can put it in here. I know. Okay. <laughs> hey. David Montoya, Chris Gibb, uh, Pit Mama, Ray J, man, all you guys, Brian Mohawk Morris, Case Hinkins, man, this is a good turnout tonight, really good turnout. Um, thank you, Facebook, for being right on. I made one adjustment. I, I you know what? I, I got a little tip from my buddy Stephen Blakesley, who runs uh, Blakesley Motorsports Media. He runs Kern County. He gave me a little tip. I went in there and made a little adjustment, and boom, we hit our sweet spot, Gib. Yeah, it was good. I mean, I, I, I like it. The questions are good. I mean, if there's more questions, it's great. I, I don't know yeah, I, guys I, out there to, I, I think we did good. Done. You know what, man? I mean, unless unless somebody else wants to come on, I think you and I just need to continue this, and we'll just come up with stuff on Sunday night. And we'll just make it a big BS session. I think a lot of guys got some stuff out of that. Even if it's one question and they can take one little nugget that we gave them and go help their race team, I think we've accomplished what we were trying to do. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I think it's fun, and I hope you guys are getting some some value out of it. You know, I think that uh, it's fun to dig out the old notebooks and look around at some of the stuff. It's, I'm sure if I posted some of the stuff up, some of these guys wouldn't even believe it. But Well, that'd be their own foolish. That, that's neutral. What, Go ahead. As neutral as possible is the word for me. That's just one of the things we work really, really hard at to try to get the thing as drivable and not twitchy and that you can just kind of sit back and do your thing. Um, because if you got to get aggressive, you know, you don't want to be fighting anything. Um, that was, we worked pretty hard at that. And it was, it was a little, it took a lot to find. Uh, it felt like once we got there, it was, it worked pretty well. Yeah. Well, you know, you said you were going to put your notes up. And most people won't believe it. That's why you do it, because my father-in-law used to tell me the same thing. You know what, Terry? I tell you this stuff. You know why? Why? Because I know you're not going to do it. <laughs> so maybe there's some truth to that. I don't know. But, hey, so yeah, you I, I stumbled across something here just a minute ago, which is pretty fun. It was a day that Ralph Woodard and I tested at Hanford, and uh, I got a page in here that's like, it's it's a full page of notes. We were testing Yamaha stuff, and literally we just sucked all day long. And it was just a big, giant thrash. And then we finally tried this one pipe. And next thing you know, uh, the thing was uh, just ballistic fast. It was it made no sense that we were we could have been that quick. Uh, With just that little of a change. Oh. Uh, well, yeah, we just, we didn't we just didn't we just didn't. I mean, we spent all day fussing around with stuff, and then uh, it was you know, an eighth we, inch, eighth inch or quarter inch on the flex, and all of a sudden, boom, you're a bullet. Oh, that's kind of that was kind of it, right? I mean, it just it was. I mean, uh, that's why I tell everybody, you know, don't if you want to try something. Gosh darn it, go try it. Don't get talked out of it. Don't let some other guy say, that ain't going to work. Because yeah, I you, you got to go. Yeah, I wish I had a dollar every go. time someone told me that. Yeah, because you got to go prove it for yourself. I don't care. Maybe they're right. Maybe they are right. But you still 
have to prove it to yourself. Otherwise, you're cheating yourself. I mean, you don't, you, you know, you never know. Um, that's the. I mean, here's a perfect example of just what I when I talk about neutral. Here's the here's the setup for my brother's twin at uh, Hanford. He got second, and this was a Buller duel. The what, rear was what, what motors? What, mo- what motors? TT seventy five. Okay. Clutches were at ninety two hundred KB eight pipes, at ten and three quarters. Um, eighty seven on the left, sixty three on the right front, one twenty nine on the left, and one twenty seven on the right. Jeez. Sixty three percent rear weight. Eighteen and eighteen and sixteen for caster. There you go, fellas. So I mean Write that down. Yeah, you mean, go go try it super, somewhere. Super super neutral. I mean it's it's those those are the things that uh it, it's just important, you know. Um it, if you if the thing's too planted, you're not gonna you're not going to be happy with it at the end of the day. I promise. It gives you more of an opportunity to to, to do other things with the car that you, uh, yeah. Well, hey, you're going to be back next week, then, right? Yeah, here, I found that pipe test. Twelve sessions, and we were, and we finally, right at the end of the day, we put a KB six on. And on, we were basically a. What what you have on there before race. a KB eight? Well, yeah, we went to a KB eight from a KB eight to a KB six, and we went from running, I think, the best of a twelve O, and then all of a sudden we're running eleven eighties, eleven seventies. Wow! Wow! Yeah. So. so the moral of that story is weather, yes. Yeah, I mean, and that's I mean that's that's. That's almost three tenths of a second. I mean, we all know that three tenths of a second would be. Uh, I mean, you don't need more. I mean, if you're a tenth quicker than someone, I mean, you're. It's that's plenty. You know, you, you, you bet you it three is. Three tenths. Is, three tenths is like a second. Is, yeah, that's like a second. Yeah, yeah, that's forever. <laughs> it's forever, dude. Yeah, you're just gonna get laughed. So. Dude, you're the man. You. I mean, I, 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 I love. No, I love this. I mean, I I've learned stuff tonight. I mean, I, I seriously have. Um, and and Kathy McDougal said, every time I tune in, I learn something. So, man, I, I, I just think that's important. We need to just keep it rolling. So you'll be back next week, right, 6 o'clock? I will. Yep, I'm in. Right on. Gibber, thank you, brother. And I'll get a hold of All you right. this week. Let's, let's figure out what we're going to do for next week. Sounds good. Thanks, right, everybody, man. for tuning in. This is great. I'm having fun. Hope I'm, you guys like it. I am. I'm loving having you. Thanks, man. All right. Take care, guys. Okay, buddy. Bye-bye. Jason Gibb, everybody. Man, I I love the guy. The guy's a master. Here he is sharing his years and years and years and years of experience with us. Um, It's free. I mean, it's free advice. Now, will it work everywhere? Absolutely not. It's not going to. But you know what? You need to still jot stuff down. Keep this stuff in your mind. I mean, Look at, thanks, Boyd Maloney. Thank you, man. Thanks for tuning in. Um, You got guys like David Montoya, and you got guys like Chris Gibb and Jason Gibb and uh, Case Hankins and all that stuff, man. I'm telling you, it doesn't hurt to have the information. Uh, He just gave you a complete setup there. Does that mean it's going to work? No, but you should write it down. Something to go try and practice today. How many times have we been there scratching our butts going, man, we want to try something, but don't really know what to do, you know, or man. And don't let anybody talk you out of what you want to try. I don't care how many times they tell you it's not going to work. Go try it. You've got to prove it to yourself. Then if it doesn't work, you can say, all right, yeah, that doesn't work. But it's never a failure unless you don't do it because then you don't ever know what it does and that's what i try to tell everybody man learn all you can try everything because even if it doesn't work you still learn something at least you know how the cart reacts when you do this and there may be some time you might need that so that's where the work comes in um and if you're not willing to do the work then it's almost like voting if you're not willing to do the work then you can't bitch um uh it racing's work i don't care whether it's speedway sprint stock cars late models NASCAR, drag racing, sprint cars, 
Um, the guys that do the work are the guys that run up front each and every week. So I'm done preaching. Uh, I just want to bring the duel back. That's right, man. Thank you, Gibber. I just want to tell everybody, listen to me. Love God first. Love yourself. Then your family. Everything else falls into line. Spread the word. Share this uh, Share this show. We're trying to get more people on Sunday nights. We're doing this to give back since we're all kind of quarantined. Um, if you like it, send Jason Gibb a, a, a hit on Facebook. Let him know you love it. Uh, if not, share it with a friend. Bring a friend next week. Love having you. Uh, this is like so, so awesome. Um, let's put the band back together. Heck yeah, Montoya. I can't wait to meet you in person, dude. Maybe I already have, but I don't remember. But if so, I, I'm, I'm excited to meet you. Maybe BK next year. Heck yeah. So, uh, anyway, I love you guys. Have a safe week. Have a great week. And, uh, man, just keep it real. Love you guys. Peace. Well, another show in the books. You are the reason we're here. We hope you'll tune in next week for another winning Wednesday here on the Northwest Race Report. Libby here. If you like tonight's show or any of our shows, please like and share on Facebook. And don't forget to stop by TerryBridgesRacing.com. Subscribe so you don't miss any of our shows. If you're serious about racing, you're constantly looking for an edge. A tenth here, a pound there. It's a non-stop pursuit to find a quicker way around the racetrack. See High Performance believes to beat the racetrack, you must become the racetrack. And that is the thought process behind all of their innovative speed products. From their line of Superfly bodies and wings to the latest dual disc center vane super brake, it's all about finding a quicker way around the racetrack. With 45 years of innovation, See High Performance is dedicated to helping racers of all skill levels find an edge. Whether it's horsepower tuning, chassis dialing, or Tire science. It's our commitment to innovation that sets them apart from the rest. Innovation is not what is, it's always been about what can be. So be all you can be with the integrity, innovation, and inspiration of C High Performance. Shop online 24 7 at chighperformance.com.